You are listening to the Keeping It Juicy podcast. Your main squeeze in nutrition. Don't forget to subscribe so you can join us every Tuesday for a brand new episode. Also, don't forget to add us on Instagram and Facebook at Keeping It Juicy Podcast. Ooh, okay. Welcome, you guys. <laughs> Welcome, you guys, to episode 81, The Biliatric Misconception. So we'll go into that in a little bit. But before we go into the book of the episode, I'm going to turn it over to Christine because we got our new nutrition in the news and we can't start it without it. <laughs> Right. Um, Today's new nutrition in the news is an interesting one. So the article is titled, Why Do Arteries Age? Study Explores Link to Gut Bacteria and Diet. So this is kind of like a different take on how the aging of arteries is related to the gut bacteria versus, I mean, it takes into account diet, obviously, but just focusing more on the gut bacteria versus like the nutrients in the food itself. So Here's kind of going into the article. It says, eat a slab of steak and your resident gut bacteria get to work immediately to break it down. As they metabolize the amino acids, um, L-carnitine and choline, they chum out a metabolic byproduct called trimethylamine, which the liver converts into trimethylamine and oxide, which is abbreviated TMAO. We're going to be talking about that a lot this episode, so it's important to know how it's formed and it actually sends that into your bloodstream. Previous studies have showed that people with higher blood levels of TMAO are more than twice as likely to have a heart attack or stroke and tend to die earlier. But to date, scientists haven't completely understood why, and that's what this article goes into. The researchers researchers of this study sought to find out, does TMAO somehow damage our vascular system? And if so, how does it do that? And it could be one reason why cardiovascular health gets worse, even among people who exercise and don't smoke as we get older. So what the researchers did is they measured the blood and arterial health of 101 older adults and 22 younger adults and found that TMAO levels significantly rise with age. And then adults with higher blood levels of TMAO significantly had worse artery function And the new study found greater signs of oxidative stress, tissue damage, and the lining of their blood vessels. I will say real quickly, I don't understand why they did 101 older adults versus 22 young adults. That's a little bit weird. There's a little discrepancy there. (laughs) Um, But that's what they did. I'm not sure why. Odd numbers. uh, But moving on. (laughs) And this is where things got interesting regarding TMAO. So then what the research did, researchers did is they fed TMAO directly to young mice and saw that their blood vessels swiftly aged. So they didn't really take into diet at this point. They just gave the mice TMAO itself. And just putting it in their diet made them look like old mice, which is super interesting. Uh, The researchers noted that 12-month-old mice, which is about the equivalent of a 35-year-old person, looked more like a 27-month-old mice, which would be an 80-year-old adult or human, after eating TMAO for several months. So it really expedited not only their arterial age, but physically aging, like how they looked in mice, which is crazy. (laughs) Insane. So preliminary data also shows that mice with higher levels of TMAO exhibit decreases in learning and memory, suggesting that this compound could also play a role in age-related cognitive decline. On the flip side, um, old mice that ate a compound called dimethylbutanol, which is actually found in trace amounts of olive oil, vinegar, and red wine, saw their vascular dysfunction reverse. Scientists believe that this compound prevents the production of TMAO. So the moral of the story is that if you're going to have some steak, make sure to kind of season it or coat it with some olive oil for cooking and pair it with a nice glass of Cabernet or a nice red wine too. You have to slow that TMAO production with the dimethylbutanol, which is found in your olive oils and your red wines. I know what I'm doing tonight. <laughs> I just, oh man. 
So interesting, uh, right? Yeah. Well, it, it's always interesting to hear about stuff like that, but people are always more interested on how can I reverse the age? Right. But, right. But I've heard so many things. And I mean, if you really think about it, vinegar, olive oil, red wine, that just screams Mediterranean diet. So yeah. Mediterranean diet. Um, <laughs> but then on the other side, you know, red meat steak is also heavily prevalent in the standard American diet, but instead we pair it with on hamburgers and with mashed potatoes and garlic bread and things like mm -hmm. that. We're not pairing it with the right fruits and vegetables and healthy fat right. sources as well. So something to keep in note, it's never ever about the individual food. It's always never. about a total dietary pattern. Um, but it is interesting to see how in isolation, these, this TMAO compound aged the mice so rapidly. Humans are not tiny mice, so it's not always applicable, mm -hmm. but it's, it's still just an association that they've seen. Hmm. Interesting stuff. So if you don't know, now you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can have that red wine, unless you just have really bad ass reflux. But that's besides... I like it. Yeah. Just have you a little... That. Yeah. I mean, I like all those things anyway, so right. um, that'd be easy to incorporate. But interesting stuff. Let us know what you guys think about that. Um, with that being said, let's move on to the bulk of the episode, which is all about the bariatric misconception. And I really want to do this episode because I work in bariatrics anyways, and people are always thinking, oh, that's just like a cop-out or dietitian. I don't understand why you do that. Well, I mean there's a point to say that if you're going to have bariatric surgery, you might as well do it underneath the supervision of a dietitian rather than just free ball it and call it a day. Cause that can lead some, to some serious consequences, which we'll go into in just a little bit. So with that being said, what is bariatric surgery and what are the types? So bariatric surgical procedures cause weight loss by restricting the amount of food that the stomach can actually hold, causing malabsorption of nutrients, or by a combination of both gastric restriction and malabsorption, which we'll get into that in a bit because I know that sounds bad. But bariatric procedures also often cause hormonal changes as well. Most weight loss surgeries today are performed using minimally invasive techniques, so laparoscopic surgery. And the most common bariatric surgery procedures are the gastric bypass, the sleeve ga gastrectomy, adjustable gastric band, not a fan of that one, and biliopancreatic di diversion with duodenal switch. <laughs> so that's a mouthful. So each surgery has its own advantages and disadvantages. So the first one is the gastric bypass. So this one, admittedly, I don't see that too often, at least in the private practice that I work out of. Um, I do see it every once in a while. Um, so even though um, this is the gold standard, I don't typically see it. So it's also known as the gastric bypass, like I said, or the ruin why. And there are two components to the procedure. So first off, a small stomach pouch is made. So about um, one, one ounce or 30 millimeters in volume. And it's created by dividing the top of the stomach from the rest of the stomach. So you just kind of separate that stomach out. And next, the first portion of the small intestine is divided and the bottom end of the divided small intestine is brought up and connected to the newly created small stomach pouch. So we're rearranging a whole lot of, thing, a lot of things. And the procedure is completed by connecting the top portion of the divided small intestine to the small intestine further down so that stomach acids and digestive enzymes from the bypass stomach and first portion of small intestine will eventually mix with the food. So the gastric bypass actually works by several ways. The newly created stomach pouch is considerably smaller and it facilitates just significantly smaller meals, so less calories. And because there is less digestion of the food by the smaller stomach pouch, and there is a segment of small intestine that would normally absorb these calories as well as nutrients that no longer has food going through it, there's probably going to be some degree of less absorption of calories and nutrients in general. 
So most importantly, the rerouting of the food stream produces changes in gut hormones that promote, that promote satiety and suppress hormones. So we've talked about this before, that's ghrelin and leptin, and reverse one of the primary mechanisms by which obesity induces type 2 diabetes. Right, so now we'll just kind of talk about the good and the bad of the gastric bypass. So obviously it does produce uh, weight loss. It can actually result in 60 to 80 percent of excess weight loss and it can be long term as well. It does restrict the amount of food that can be consumed. Um, it may lead to conditions that increase energy expenditure. Kind of, you know, when you lose weight, you're going to be more motivated to do more things. Things are going to be easier to do. So over time, people will be spending more energy as well. And it can produce favorable changes in gut hormones that reduce appetite and enhance satiety. Typical maintenance is about 50% of excess weight loss. So now we'll go into some of the cons. It is technically a more complex operation than the sleeve, which um, potentially could result in greater complication rates. It can lead to long-term vitamin and mineral deficiencies, particularly deficits in vitamin B12, iron, calcium, and folate. It generally has a longer hospital stay than the sleeve as well because it is a more complex operation and it does require adherence to dietary recommendations, lifelong vitamin and mineral supplementation, and follow-up compliance. Yes, and we highly stress that even after surgery, we require our patients to come back and see mm -hmm. us to make sure they're taking the vitamins and minerals and to have follow-up appointments for over a year out from surgery. So there's that. Honestly, you know, anything is a lifelong thing. Right. Too. So you require it for a year, but after a year of the follow-ups, they can't go back to eating how they were before too. Right, right. And I always teach them that. The time but. to, you know, solidify some of those changes. Right. So the next one, which is the most common one that I see um, out of a lot of the patients that come through, is a sleeve gastrectomy. So the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, often called the sleeve, like I said, is performed by removing approximately 80% of the stomach. So that's a lot. And the remaining stomach is kind of like a tubular pouch and it looks like a banana. So I just thought that was cute. But anyways, <laughs> this procedure works by several mechanisms. So first, the new stomach pouch holds a considerably smaller volume than the normal stomach and helps to significantly reduce the amount of food and that's the calories that can be consumed. And the greater the impact, however, seems to be the effect that soji has on gut hormones that impact a number of factors, like we said, including hunger, satiety, and blood sugar, blood sugar control, which I've seen a lot of that happening as well in my patients. And short-term studies show that the sleeve is as effective as the ruin why a gastric bypass in terms of weight loss and improvement of or remission of diabetes. There's also evidence that suggests the sleeve, similar to gastric bypass, is effective in improving type 2 diabetes independent of that weight loss. So the good about this, um, so it restricts the amount of food that the stomach can hold, so that's great. So the next good point is that it induces rapid and significant weight loss as comparative studies find similar to that of the ruin why gastric bypass so there has been some sort of uh data that shows that there is a weight loss of over 50 percent that is also maintained which is similar to that of the bypass anyways and it requires no foreign objects Woo! Um, which <laughs> which the the gastric band does which we'll go into that and no there's no bypass or rerouting of the food stream so that's awesome and it involves a relatively short hospital stay of approximately two days it says two days but a lot of my patients are in and out the same day i'm not even kidding like they go in in the morning and they leave by the night and it causes favorable favorable changes in gut hormones that suppress hunger reduce appetite and improve satiety the bad is at is that it's a non-reversible surgery um, and it has a potential for long-term vitamin deficiencies if they don't follow our advice from the dietitians, and has a higher early complication rate than the gastric band, which the gastric band, I feel like, is the worst, but we'll yeah. go into that right now. <laughs> so have, 
in your experience, like, you know, you hear a lot about like stomach stretching and whatnot. So you're clearly like reducing the size of a stomach to make it look like a banana. Right. If people go back to eating large amounts of food, can that stomach restretch over time? Yeah, it definitely can. I've seen people complain about um, gaining the weight back, but they're going back to the old eating yeah. habits. Okay. And when that happens, I'm like, well, you shouldn't have had this surgery in the first place. Right. So not a good candidate. No. Um, so it, it still can restretch to be a larger size. Not as large as before, but still right. larger. Gotcha. Gotcha. Good to know. So now we're going to move on to the adjustable gastric band, which it doesn't appear that you're a fan of this one. No. Um, we'll get your opinion on it after we uh, spill the facts on it, and then you can <laughs> say your piece. Uh, so the adjustable gastric band, often called the band, involves an inflatable band that is uh, placed around the upper portion of the stomach, creating a small pouch above the band and the rest of the stomach is below the band. The common explanation of how this device works is that with the smaller stomach pouch, eating just a small amount of food will satisfy hunger and promote the feeling of fullness. The size of the stomach opening can be adjusted by filling the band with uh, sterile saline, which is injected through a port that's placed under the skin. So reducing the size of the opening is gradually done over time with repeated adjustments or fills. Uh, the notion that the band is a restrictive procedure, which basically means works by restricting how much food can be consumed per meal and by restricting the emptying of the food through the band, has been challenged by studies and show that the food passes through rather quickly through the band and that the absence of hunger or feeling of being full and satisfied was not related to the food remaining in the pouch above the band. What is known is that there is no malabsorption. The food is digested and absorbed as it would be normally. The clinical impact of the band seems to be that it reduces hunger, which helps the patients to decrease the amount of calories that are being consumed. So now diving into the good of this band, it does re reduce the amount of food that the stomach can hold, and it does induce excess weight loss of approximately 40 to 50%. It involves no cutting of the stomach or rerouting the intestines, which is nice. You know, it's always good when you don't have to cut something. Uh, it does require a shorter hospital stay, usually less than 24 hours, with some of the centers being able to discharge the patient within the same day. Um, it is reversible and adjustable, which is kind of nice that it's not, you know, a forever, a forever thing. And it does have the lowest rate of early post-operative complications and mortality among the approved bariatric procedures. And it does have the lowest risk for vitamin, vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So now going into some of the cons of the band, it is slower and less early weight loss than other uh, surgical procedures, and it is the greatest. It does show the greatest percentage of patients failing to lose at least fifty percent of their excess body fat compared to the other surgeries commonly performed. So it's slower and it's not quite as effective. It seems it does require a foreign device to remain in the body. You don't want anything foreign in the body. Uh, it can result in possible band slippage or band erosion into the stomach into a small percentage of patients. So now that foreign object is going into your <laughs> stomach. Um, and it can have mechanical problems with the band or the tube, basically the port in a small percentage of patients. And it can result in dilation of the esophagus if the patient overeats. So and it does require strict adherence to the post-operative diet and post-operative follow-up visits. And it does have the highest rate of re-operation. You're fucking telling me. I, <laughs> so what I have mean, you seen? I mean, I've never worked in a bariatric clinic. I just know what I've learned in school from this. But you've actually worked with people. So tell, hmm. tell us what you have seen with this. I Like, it's... An, I love the fact that it's a small percentage, which uh, granted this is from the bariatric website, but I've seen a handful of people that come in for a sleeve operation when they had the band operation years ago, and all of them say the same thing, 
um, the band was um, slipping upwards, which that is dangerous in itself. It was eroding or it was causing other issues or they gained the weight back, which means, which tells me they didn't stick to the post-operative diet. Right. So even when I go over the new procedure for them to have the sleeve, di- sleeve diet, they're like, oh, I know all of this. I'm like, well, why did you gain the weight back if you knew all of it? Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, th- there's a lot of factors that go into it, but I, I don't like the gastric band. I think it's an outdated procedure and it should not be used in general. I mean, I know some people would argue that all these procedures shouldn't be done. Of course. Um, which makes sense. But like another thing that is coming about, which is not included in what we're going to talk, what we're talking about today is, so this is the gastric band. It's a band, like a rubber band, um, like on your stomach. Mm-hmm. Well, there's another procedure that is slowly coming out. I think it starts with an O. Obalon? There you go. Um, and that's literally a balloon in your stomach. Right. So how that one works is you swallow these, like, pills, and it's, it's, it's non-surgical. So you don't have to be mm-hmm. opened up whatsoever, which is nice. Um, so you swallow the pill, and it starts to inflate uh, within your stomach. So you're, you constantly have, you know, something in your stomach, so you shouldn't feel full. You know, there are receptors on your stomach that when you're full, your stomach is, you know, stretched out, those receptors are triggered. Mm-hmm. There's a cascade of hormones that follows that. So you're in this constant state of fullness, but your body's not getting any calories from it. So that's very confusing to your body. Over time, you might end up with maybe three balloons in your, in your stomach. And then you, I believe the way you get rid of the balloons, I'm not a hundred percent on this. The website, I did research on it because they contacted me. I think they are removed by a medical doctor. They (laughs) they take like a tube down your stomach or they, you know, through your stomach down into your stomach. The laparoscopically probably. Yeah. And then it kind of like pops, I guess. And And then they either pull it back out or you pass it through i'm not a hundred percent sure don't quote me on how the balloon is removed (laughs) but my issue with that is if your stomach has gotten used to being this full you know with with feeling this constant state of fullness when you remove the balloons you're going to be starving even though you're getting enough calories your whole psychological you know the cascade of fullness signals are going to be completely thrown off because you're going to have been full for nine months, 10 months, a year, I don't know. And then these balloons are gone and those receptors are no longer gonna be activated. You're gonna be tricked into thinking you're starving. If you guys could see my face the entire time you were explaining that, um, I, I just hate it. Like, I mean, I've heard of it before, but I've never worked with a patient that has gone through that surgery. I know my boss has, and she has some material for it, but I, like any, any foreign material in their body, I just feel like there's going to be something wrong or like it's n- nothing in your body that wasn't created by your body is it's not going to last long. It's right. like even, um, what you might call it? Um, like, what was it? Heart monitors? God damn it. Like a pacemaker? Yes. Even pacemakers don't even last that long. So mm-hmm. God forbid you put like a balloon or a gastric band um those aren't gonna last long and a a balloon in your stomach that just sounds diabolical yeah it's it's very odd um but if we really take a step back and think about bariatric surgery in general (laughs) it is it's very diabolical you know sometimes you are redoing you know with the gastric bypass you are completely changing your anatomy Right. How your body was created to digest food. Right. That's pretty intense. Um, the sleeve, you are physically removing some of your stomach. Right. These are intense procedures. Right. Um, we'll get into more of the pros and cons of, and the stigma against bariatric surgery very soon. Right. But if you really think about it, you know, could you imagine being in a room with someone who's like, I think what we're going to do is make the stomach smaller, but then take the intestine and patch it up here and 
<laughs> like, could you oh, imagine? No. Like, you saw your face when you when I was talking about putting a balloon in your stomach. Like, could you imagine <laughs> being in that room when they're like first developing the first yeah. gastric bypass surgery? Like, gastric yeah. bypass. You are bypassing the gastric your stomach and now it's prevalent like it like it happens like I didn't even realize how often it's happening until like I was in an internship and I see the amount of people that come through the clinic I'm like holy shit like this is like a one and done people come in and out like Mm -hmm. it's very common so it's good to have education on it and that's why we're dedicating an episode to it and just knowing the different types and the pros and the cons. And it is great for some people, you know, right. some people do very well with it. Right. We're not bashing on it. <laughs> no. mm. um, anyways, before we go into more of our personal opinions and the stigmas against it, we want to finish. Um, there's still another surgery that we have it's a little bit more complicated. So it's a biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch, aka the BPDDS gastric bypass. So it's more complicated than the Wu and Y. So I'm just going to call it the BPD. I can't keep saying the whole name. Um, it's a procedure with two components. So first, a small tubular stomach pouch is created by removing a portion of the stomach. So you're creating a, the banana stomach again, like the sleeve surgery. And next, a large portion of the small intestine is bypassed. The duodenum, or the first portion of the small intestine, is divided just past the outlet of the stomach. So a segment of the last portion of the small intestine is then brought up and connected to the outlet of the newly created stomach. So that when the patient eats, the food goes through a newly created tubular stomach pouch and empties directly into the last segment of the small intestine. So roughly three-fourths of the small intestine is bypassed by the food stream. That's a shit. That's a lot of bypassing. That's a lot. That's where, like, the majority of your digestive enzymes are, you know, right. secreted and released. Like, that's, right. The, you know, there's a lot that goes on there. Right. So the bypass small intestine, which carries the bile and the pancreatic enzymes that are necessary for the breakdown and absorption of protein and fat, is reconnected to the last portion of the small intestine so that they can eventually mix with the food stream because they like to create a little smoothie before it becomes something else. Um, Similar to other surgery described above, the BPDDS initially helps to reduce the amount of food that is consumed. However, over time, this effect lessens and patients are able to eventually consume near normal amounts of food, like we talked about with the issue with the sleeve. Unlike the other procedures, there is a significant amount of small bowel that is bypassed by this food stream that we're talking about. Additionally, the food does not mix with the bile and pancreatic enzymes until very far down the small intestine. This results in a significant decrease in the absorption of calories and nutrients, particularly protein and fat, like we said, as well as nutrients and vitamins dependent on fat for absorption, so the fat-soluble vitamins and nutrients. Lastly, this surgery is similar to the gastric bypass and the sleeve, so it affects the gut hormones in a manner that impacts the hunger and satiety cues as well as blood sugar control. This surgery is considered to be the most effective surgery for the treatment of diabetes among those that we described here today. The good news is that it results in greater weight loss than the other surgeries and about 60 to 70 percent excess weight loss or greater even at the five-year follow-up and eventually um, it allows patients to eventually eat near normal meals and reduces the absorption of fat by 70 percent or more so it causes favorable changes in gut hormones to reduce appetite and improve satiety and it's the most effective against diabetes compared to the other surgeries the bad um, it has higher complication rates and risk for mortality compared to the other surgeries so <laughs> it requires a longer hospital stay than the gastric band or the sleeve and it has a greater potential to cause protein deficiencies and long-term deficiencies in a number of vitamins and minerals like iron calcium zinc 
that soluble vitamins such as vitamin D and compliance with follow-up visits and care and strict adherence to dietary and vitamin supplementation guidance guidelines are absolutely critical to avoid serious complications with, from protein and certain vitamin deficiencies, especially with this surgery. I so mean, it's a lot. Yeah, if you're having reduced fat absorption of 70%, you're going to have you know, a, a huge decrease in your ability to absorb your fat-soluble vitamins. Fat, right. fat is where you get your fat-soluble vitamins. Um, and oftentimes, uh, a lot of our patients, like I tell them from the get-go, expect to take the vitamins and minerals for the rest of your life. Just expect yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and, that's one of, and that's not the worst thing in the world. It's just compliance. Right. Um, you know, I'm, I hope, you know, they don't feel like, oh, yeah, I've lost the weight. I don't need to do any of this anymore. It's like, well, you're going to have potentially another health condition down the road, too. Right. You know, fat is important is an important part of our diet. It's an essential macronutrient. Your fat soluble vitamins, you need those too. Right. I just um the only the only thing I'm kind of skeptical about, like I have an idea of what surgeries the doctor chooses or mm -hmm. discusses with the patient because the patient lists are concerned they see the comorbidities or anything else and the doctor recommends like this surgery or that surgery mm -hmm. and then the patient ultimately decides mm -hmm. um it's just i don't know a whole lot about it but i can only imagine um but i don't come across someone um with that last surgery um which is the most which is the most complicated one. Oh, it sounds um, insane like yeah I'm trying to visualize it in my brain and i'm having a hard time doing it so. <laughs> it just like I said, oh, the, most, the balloon. Right. Like, and for being honest. Right. And the like I said, the most common one I've seen is the sleeve. And yeah. then followed by that, the gastric bypass. And then everyone else is just I haven't come across anyone else, I'll be honest. Okay, gotcha. You don't do the band very often? Or just I, I have not done the band band oh, at all. Okay. okay. Like a, a lot of the people that I come across have already had the band, but they're coming ah, for the gotcha. sleeve. So, so you're doing like rework, basically. Basically. Gotcha. <laughs> so that's why you have had such a bad experience with the band. Yeah, because. Gotcha. I mean, I, I just like I'm sure there are great candidates for that, mm -hmm. but but those that came to me all mm -hmm. have bad experiences with the gastric band. So according to the uh, bariatric website, we'll have it linked in our show notes, uh, the perfect candidate is someone with a BMI over 40 or more than 100 pounds overweight, um, or a BMI of over 35 and at least one or more obesity-related comorbidities, such as type 2 diabetes, hypertension, sleep apnea, or other respiratory disorders, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, osteoarthritis, lipid abnormalities, gastrointestinal disorders, and heart disease. Um, also a good candidate is someone with an inability to achieve a healthy weight loss for a sustained period of time with prior weight loss efforts. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, that last one, I just have a little bit, this is like one of my issue like yes i i like working with bariatric surgery because i like the fact that at least i'll be able to support it because if dietitians weren't there i feel like everyone would be having issues right. but my skepticism is not everyone has even done um a healthy weight loss type of hmm. attempt before it's always been like crash or commercial type diet yes it's been crash or commercial um and then someone and i've had for the past couple of weeks i had like a handful of people coming in for um i'll be honest a handful of people coming in for um one time only consult with us because they're planning on getting the bariatric surgery within the next month because of cash pay so typically medicare or depending on the insurance, it requires three to six visits. And they, the, I'm, get, I'm literally compacting all of the information that I give to them in like a 30 minute to an hour period. 
And they're yeah. probably retaining this much of that. Right. And they're like, oh, I just, I just, I just, I don't even have that much to lose, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, in my head, I'm like, why are you here? Um, and I, ex- I always express that to my boss or um, like, if there's a Kate, if there's someone that I don't agree with that should not be going through with the surgery, I, I always express my opinion on it. And a couple of times it has stopped um, patients from getting it because they're getting it for the wrong reasons. So, And they're unfortunately going to be one of the failures or one of the ones that needs rework done or gains more of the weight back than prior to surgery or ends up with these horrible nutrition deficiencies and worse problems down the road too. Right. And it's like, I'm not trying to put the doctor that does it on blast, but, <laughs> but, like, I, but I know with the whole pandemic going on and elective surgery is not really like being put on halt, right. but i apparently I was talking to one of the patients and she said, oh, Dr. So-and-so wanted me to go ahead and get the surgery as quick as I can before they stop elective surgeries. I'm like, okay, that just sounds like a cash grab. I don't like that. Like, you, can, you, can, you can tell, like, why they're doing it. Right. Like, I got frustrated that you even said that. So, <laughs> I mean, I feel like there's going to be – there's a good and bad for a lot of um, – uh, oh, the health, whole nutrition industry, the whole health right. and dietetics industry is full of like good and bad. Like there's a dirty underbelly to every industry. Fun times. Great. <laughs> great. Moving on. Moving on. <laughs> but let's kind of talk about how nutrition is involved. I did talk about the consoles we require before um, pre-surgery appointments. Um, and then some of those appointments are like group classes where you do meet others um, that are in similar shoes. And then we have post-operation appointments. So we want to make sure everything is going smoothly. So nutrition and supplementation plays a huge, huge critical role in the ongoing health of the patients that are undergoing bariatric surgery. And we develop patient education materials for each chapter of the bariatric surgery journey like we said about the pre-operative, post-operative, and the lifelong diet, and even in between. And we were gonna require calcium and multivitamin supplements. Um, Sometimes we're gonna have iron, and a lot of our patients typically have vitamin B12 shots, which are important, um, especially since you're cutting the stomach, less absorption and whatnot. Um, and then protein supplementation, that's huge for after surgery as well in regards to facilitating that weight loss, um, improving recovery, and just making sure your hair doesn't fall out. So it's just a a lot of issues. And that also, like, we can give all of our recommendations as much as we want, me, the doctor, the psychologist that they also see, and but ultimately it's going to be up to the patient's compliance. Of course, as with any, any weight loss or health improvement attempt, like it's always about compliance. So this is no different. It's just pretty, pretty high risk. You know, when we think about it, like compared to eating more fresh fruits and vegetables or cooking a little Mm -hmm. bit cleaner, like you are, you are going under surgery. So right. compliance is very important as with any surgery you go through. Right. And I always tell my patients real quick that, yes, you're having this. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I have so many opinions on this episode. <laughs> like, I always tell my patients if compliance is very important. Like mm-hmm. we're talking, if we're talking about the liver shrinking diet, the diet that you go on before surgery, Doctors can refuse you from surgery if you don't follow that. After surgery, if you don't, if you aren't compliant, you might end up back in the hospital. You might gain the weight back. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important for you to sit here, listen, understand. If you have questions, please ask. Don't just, don't just start eating fried chicken as soon as you can tolerate it. Yeah, it's not this like glorious, like oh my gosh, I'm gonna be so skinny. Like no, this is a major surgery. Like you gotta Mm -hmm. listen. 
Okay, so now we are going to dive into some of the misconceptions about bariatric surgery. So the first big one is that most people who have bariatric surgery regain their weight. So as many as 50% of patients may regain a small amount of weight, about 5%, two years or more following their surgery. However, longitudinal studies find that most bariatric surgery patients maintain successful weight loss long term. It is important to note that successful weight loss is kind of an arbitrary, arbitrary term, and it's defined as weight loss equal to or greater than 50% of excess body weight loss. And another thing to keep in mind too, like successful results are determined by the patient and their perceived improvement of quality of life. You can't tell someone they're successful or not because you don't know their goals and their lifestyle and what they wanted as the outcome. So that's important to keep in mind too. Mm -hmm. And then the next misconception is that the chance of dying from metabolic and bariatric surgery is more than a chance of dying from obesity, which is false. As your body size increases, longevity just naturally decreases. Individuals with severe obesity have a number of life-threatening conditions that greatly increase their risk of dying, such as type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and more that we've covered multiple times before. In data involving nearly 60,000 bariatric patients from the ASMBS, Bariatric Centers of Excellence database, show that the risk of death within the 30 days following bariatric surgery averages about 0.13%, so approximately, approximately one out of 1,000 patients. And this rate is considerably less than most other operations, including gallbladder and hip replacement surgery, which is weird to think about. Therefore, are both super common. Right. Therefore, in spite of poor health status of bariatric patients prior to surgery, the chance of dying from the operation is very low, and large studies found that the risk of death from any cause is considerably less for bariatric patients throughout time than for individuals affected by severe obesity who have never had the surgery. So the benefits of bariatric surgery with regard to mortality far outweigh the risk, and it's important to note that as with any serious surgical operation, the decision to have bariatric surgery should be discussed with your surgeon and your family members and your loved ones. So it's a two-pronged approach to this. So the next uh, misconception that we're going to go into is that uh, bariatric surgery is a cop-out. Uh, some people will say, you know, to lose and maintain weight, individuals affected by severe obesity just need to go on a diet and exercise program. Uh, so individuals who are affected by severe obesity are resistant to long-term weight loss by diet and exercise. The National Institutes of Health Experts panel recognized that long-term weight loss, or in other words, the ability to maintain weight loss, is nearly impossible for those affected by severe obesity by any means other than metabolic or bariatric surgery. So bariatric surgeries are effective in maintaining long-term weight loss in part because these procedures offset certain conditions caused by dieting that are responsible for rapid and efficient weight regain after dieting. When a person loses weight, energy expenditure, which we know is the calories the body burns, is reduced. With diet, energy expenditure at rest and with activity is reduced to a greater extent then can be explained by changes in the body size or composition, which is uh, the amount of lean and fat tissue that you have. At the same time, appetite regulation is altered following a diet, increasing hunger and the desire to eat. Therefore, there are significant biological differences between someone who has lost weight by diet and someone who of the same size and body composition to that of the individual who has never lost weight. So basically what we're saying is, you know, dieting does produce metabolic changes. We know that for a fact versus someone who of the same size hasn't gone through said diet. You know, their their metabolism and the results of that diet are going to be very different between those two individuals. So in contrast to dieting, weight loss following bariatric surgery does not reduce energy expenditure or the amount of the cap or the amount of calories the body burns to levels greater than predicted by the changes of body weight and composition. So what we mean by in relation to um, energy expenditure and the size is bigger bodies need more calories. That's just, you know, kind of, we know that. 
So predicted means like as your body gets smaller, you need less calories, but the bariatric surgery keeps your energy expenditure, your metabolic rate higher than dieting would. So some studies even find that certain operations may increase energy expenditure. In addition, some bariatric procedures, unlike diet, also causes biological changes that help reduce energy intake. A decrease in energy intake with surgery results in part from the anatomical changes to the stomach or the gut that restrict um, food intake or cause malabsorption of nutrients. In addition, bariatric surgery increases the production of certain gut hormones that interact with the brain to reduce hunger, decrease appetite, and enhance satiety, which is the feeling of fullness. In these ways, bariatric and metabolic surgery, unlike dieting, produces long-term weight loss. Right. And another thing to consider um, before we move on to the last misconception is um, this, like like I've just told you before, there, there are some people that kind of use it as a cop-out, in my opinion. But there are also a lot of people that I've come across that have that are not using it as a cop-out. I know a particular patient that has a disability that causes her to be extremely and easily fatigued. So she's not even able to expend as much energy as you and I would. And that's kind of like the immune, like that class, basically she's disabled because of that fact. And because of a whole assortment of things that are causing- Is it chronic like, fatigue? No, it's something no. else. I forgot which I forgot what it was, but it was something else um, in regards to her muscles. It's not mm -hmm. it's either, but that mm -hmm. has led to her weight gain. Absolutely. And, and um, even when she tried to eat the appropriate foods, because there's a lot of other issues happening, she was not able to lose that weight, and that was causing other issues to come about, like diabetes or hypertension. So the only way she could help combat that is bariatric surgery. Right, um, great example of how it's not always a cop-out. Like there are right. some other metabolic abnormalities and bariatric surgery will just help enhance the process. Right, and she didn't get a complicated surgery. It was just a regular sleeve and she was able to have a good weight loss mm -hmm. um, and able to maintain it. Right. Um, so those that so the last and final misconception that we often see with bariatric surgery is that bariatric patients have serious health problems caused by vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So bariatric operations can lead to the deficiencies in vitamins and minerals by reducing nutrient intake or by causing reduced absorption from the intestine. Bariatric operations vary in the extent of the malabsorption that they may cause and vary in which nutrition may be affected. The more malabsorptive bariatric procedures also increase the risk for protein deficiency, as we talked about. So deficiencies in micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, can, and protein can adversely affect health, causing fatigue, anemia, bone and muscle loss, impaired night vision, low immunity, loss of appropriate nerve function, and even some cognitive defects. Fortunately, fortunately, Nutrient deficiencies following surgery can be avoided with appropriate diet and use of dietary supplements. So the vitamins and minerals, and in some cases, protein supplements, not in some cases, all cases, protein supplements. And the nutrient guidelines for different types of bariatric surgery procedures have actually been established in basically the Bariatric Nutritional Experts Committee and published in the Journal for Surgery for Obesity and Other Related Disorders related disorders. So before and after surgery, patients are advised of the dietary and supplement needs and are followed by a dietitian with bariatric expertise. I mean, I tell my patients from the get-go, from the first appointment with them, are you able to afford the vitamins and minerals and calcium and the protein supplements? And like, if they say no, I'm not going to recommend it. But if they say yes, okay, let's move forward. So <laughs> most bariatric programs also require patients to have their vitamins and minerals checked on a regular basis following surgery as well. So they have that going on as well. And nutrient deficiencies and any associated health issues are preventable with patient monitoring and patient compliance 
health problems due to deficiencies usually occur in patients who do not regularly follow up with their surgeon to establish these healthy nutrient levels, which I've seen that. Um, And like, granted, I did take a step back and I was just teaching classes for a bit, but they, these, this past month and a half, I've actually increased my hours and have started seeing patients more one-on-one again. And then like with that, like I'm telling them from the get-go, you need to follow up with us. I would like you to follow up with us. If you don't follow up with us, I, I don't know if there's anything wrong or if there's anything else going on. Because I've had an issue when a patient came in for a follow-up appointment. It was like his second appointment, but he rescheduled it twice. Mm-hmm. Um, and apparently, like, a lot of the questions I have to ask is, like, are there any, like, issues in regards to appetite, taste, nausea, vomiting, whatnot? whatnot? And he's like, well, um, meats taste a little metallic now. I'm like, uh-oh. Are you taking your calcium and your multivitamins? Oh no, why not? Oh, um, the money goes towards my wife first, and then we get the calcium and multivitamins. I was like, okay, you signed up for this program, um, saying you could afford it, right. Um, right. and uh, like she was describing to me some of the stuff that she was using it for, which I mean they could have cut back on. I'm not going to go into it, but basically I said. If you do not go back to your calcium and your multivitamins, this will continue on a trend that will only make you feel worse. Mm-hmm. Long story short, he went back to taking it and he feels much better now. It's just something important to think about because if you do have nutrient deficiencies, it can show up in physical symptoms. Oh, of course. And so. the unfortunate side of that is the physical symptoms are usually after it's been going on for quite some time. And sometimes they're not reversible. Right. Um, sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. So <laughs> be careful. So this was a very um, long episode. I think it was a little bit longer than we intended, but we had a lot of opinions today. Yes, yes we did. <laughs> if you have any experience with uh, bariatric surgery or any other surgeries, procedures, myths that mm-hmm. you'd like us to look into more, please let us know. So with that, we will close out with our social media shout out of the week. It does go to at health by Hill. She is an aspiring dietitian. Uh, She's going to school for nutrition right now. And she just posts a nice wide variety of different recipes and food inspiration. I definitely got hungry while I was scrolling and got a couple new ideas. Uh, So check her out. It's a very nice page. And just a reminder to all of our social media shout outs, we are sending you guys a sticker. So... Show the sticker. Whip it out. This is the sticker. It's very <laughs> cool. Send us a message and we will send you guys one. Yeah, we definitely appreciate it. And if you want to be on our next social media shout out, like we all said, like our sh- like our shit, send us shit, and then comment on our shit. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. With that being said, we're gonna close out the episode with my usual. Stay safe. Don't touch nobody and don't let nobody touch you because COVID is still happening. It's still out there, guys. All right. Be safe, be sanitized, and we'll catch you next time. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Keeping It Juicy podcast. You mean squeeze and nutrition. Don't forget to subscribe so you can join us every Tuesday for a brand new episode. Also, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Keeping It Juicy Podcast. We'd love to hear from you, so please leave us a review. Five stars, no less. On whatever platform you're listening to, or send us an email at keepingitjuicypodcast at gmail.com. Or if you have any topics you'd like for us to touch upon, shoot us an email. Until next time, don't do anything that I wouldn't do.